Chapter 8 of The Clockwork Man by E. V. Odell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Clockwork Man. Chapter 8 The Clock. 1. At first, it seemed to the doctor that his companion was about to explain matters further. There was still something vaguely communicative about his manner, and a kind of noise issued from his rapidly moving jaws. But it was not a human noise. It began with a succession of deep-toned growls and grunts, and ended abruptly in a distinct bark. Hydrophobia flashed through the doctor's mind, but he dismissed the idea immediately. He had lit a cigarette in order to soothe his nerves. He was trying so hard to rationalize the whole proceeding, to fit the clockwork man into some remotely possible order of things. But it was a difficult process, for no sooner had he grouped certain ideas in his head than some fresh manifestation took place which rendered all previous theories futile. At the present moment, for instance, it was obvious that some new kind of structural alteration was taking place in the clockwork man's physiognomy. The phenomenon could hardly be classed in the same category as the sudden growth of beard, although there were points in common. Hair was again visible, this time spread all over the rounded face and on the jaw. The nose was receding and flattening out. The eyes were dwindling in size, and the expression in them changed into a dull stare. The bark was repeated and followed by an angry rumbling. The doctor dropped his cigarette on the plate before him and grasped the edges of the table. His eyes were riveted upon the ghastly spectacle of transmutation. "'Oh, God!' he cried out at last, and shivering from head to foot. "'Are you doing these things on purpose to frighten me? Or can't you—can't you help it? Do you think I don't believe you? Do you think I can keep on deceiving myself?' I tell you, I'm ready to believe anything. I capitulate. I only ask you to let me down lightly. I'm only human, and human nerves weren't made to stand this." Grrrr, growled the clockwork man. Wow, wow. Can't help it. Woof, woof. Most regrettable. Wow, wow. Atavism. Tendency to return. Remote species. Moment's notice. Family failing. Darwinism. Better in a moment. Something gone wrong with the controls. There. That's done it. Phew. His face suddenly cleared, and all trace of the canine resemblance vanished as if by magic. He got up and took two or three jerk-like strides up and down the room. Must keep going. When I feel like this. Either food or violent stimulus. Otherwise, the confounded thing runs down, and there you are." He paused and confronted Allingham, who had risen from his chair and was still trembling. "'How can I help it?' implored the clockwork man in despair. "'They made me like this. I don't want to alarm you, but you know, it alarms me sometimes. You can't imagine how trying it is to feel that at any moment you might change into something else some horrible tree-climbing ancestor. The thing ought not to happen, but it's always possible. They should have thought of that when they made the clock." "'It mustn't happen,' said the doctor, recovering slightly. That's the flat fact. If it's food you require, then food you shall have." It had suddenly flashed across his fevered mind that downstairs in the surgery there lay a collection of tin foods and patent medicines, samples that had been sent for him to test. Rather than risk a further manifestation of collapse on the part of the clockwork man, he would sacrifice these. 2. He was only just in time. On the way down the stairs that led to the basement surgery, the clockwork man began to flap his ears violently and it was then that the doctor noticed for the first time this circumstance that had so puzzled Arthur Withers. But the faculty seemed, in comparison with other exhibitions, a mere trifle, a sort of mannerism that one might expect from a being so strangely constituted. Pushing his companion into the surgery, the doctor commenced opening tins for all he was worth. The process calmed him, and he had time to think a little. 
For half an hour he opened tins, and passed them over to the clockwork man, without noticing very much what the latter did with them. Then he went on to bottles containing patent foods, phosphates, hypophosphates, glycerohypophosphates, all the phosphates, in fact, combined with malt or other substances which might be considered almost necessary as an auxiliary diet for the clockwork man. At least the latter seemed grateful to receive whatever was given to him, and his general manner became decidedly more possible. There seemed less chance now of a drastic relapse. The doctor had locked the door of the surgery. It would be embarrassing to be discovered in such circumstances, and Mrs. Masters might faint with horror at the sight of the empty tins and bottles and the gorging visitor. It was symptomatic of the doctor's frame of mind that even now the one thing he dreaded more than anything else was the intrusion of a curious world into this monstrous proceeding. He had been forced into accepting the evidence of his own eyes, but there still remained in him a strong desire to hush up the affair, to protect the world at large from so fierce a shock to its established ideas. The surgery was a low-pitched apartment and it was approached by patients from the outside by way of the area steps. One door communicated with the dark passage that led to the kitchen quarters, and the other opened directly upon the area. A double row of shelves, well stocked with bottles, occupied the center of the room and divided it into two halves. Beneath the window stood the doctor's neat bureau, and to the left of this was a low couch beside the wall. A shaded lamp on the desk was sufficient to light the room for ordinary purposes, but there was a gas burner near the further door, which had to be lit when the doctor was engaged upon some very close examination or had to perform a slight operation. Directly underneath this burner there stood an armchair of ample proportions, and it was here that the clockwork man had seated himself at the beginning of his orgy. The doctor sat upon the couch, with his hands limply hanging between his knees. He was conscious of perspiration, but made no attempt to wipe his forehead. His heart was knocking hard against his ribs, and occasionally missed a beat. He noticed this fact also, but it caused him little concern. Now and again he looked swiftly at the clockwork man and studied his extraordinary method of mastication, the rapid vibratory movement of the jaws, the apparent absence of any kind of voluntary effort. Uppermost in the doctor's mind, was the reflection that he of all persons should have been selected by an undiscriminating providence to undergo this distressing and entirely unprecedented experience. It was an ironic commentary upon his reactionary views and his comfortable doctrine of common sense. He had been convinced in spite of himself, and the effort to resist conviction had strained his mental powers uncomfortably. He felt very strongly his inability to cope with the many problems that would be sure to arise in connection with the clockwork man. It was too much for one man's brain. There would have to be a convocation of all the cleverest men in Europe in order to investigate such an appalling revelation. He pictured himself in the act of introducing this genuine being from a future age, and the description he would have to give of all that had happened in connection with him. Even that prospect set his brain reeling. He would like to be able to shirk the issue. It was enough to have looked upon this archetype of the future. The problem now was to forget his existence. But that would be impossible. The clockwork man was the realization of the future. There was no evading that. The future. Man had evolved into this. He had succeeded somehow in adding to his normal powers some kind of mechanism that opened up vast possibilities of action in all sorts of dimensions. There must have been an enormous preparatory period before the thing became finally possible, generations of striving and failure and further experiment. But the indefatigable spirit of man had triumphed in the end. He had arisen at last superior to time and space and taken his place in the center of the universe. It was a fulfillment of all the prophecies of the great scientists since the discovery of evolution. Such reflections flitted hazily through the doctor's mind as he strove in vain to find a practical solution of the problem. What was the clock? He knew, from hearsay, that it was situated at the back of this strange being's head. 
Tom Driver had seen it and described it in his clumsy fashion. Since that episode, the doctor had visualized something in the nature of an instrument affixed to the clockwork man's head, and perhaps connected with his cerebral processes. Was it a kind of super-brain? Had there been found some means of lengthening the convolutions of the human brain, so that man's thought traveled further and so enabled him to arrive more swiftly at ultimate conclusions? That seemed suggestive. It must be that, in some way, the cerebral energy of man had been stored up, as electricity in a battery, and then released by mechanical processes. At least that was the vague conclusion that came into the doctor's mind and stuck there. It was the only theory at all consonant with his own knowledge of human anatomy. All physiological action could be traced to the passage of nervous energy from one center to another, and it was obvious that, in the case of the clockwork man, such energy was subjected to enormous acceleration and probably distributed along especially prepared paths. There was nothing in the science of neuropathy to account for such disturbances and reactions. There were neural freaks. The doctor had himself treated some remarkable cases of nervous disorder, but the behavior of the clockwork man could not be explained by any principle within human knowledge. Not the least puzzling circumstance about him was the fact that now and again his speech and manner made it impossible to accept the supposition or mechanical origin, whilst at other times his antics induced a positive conviction that he was really a sort of highly perfected toy. Presently the clockwork man got up and began walking up and down the room, in his slow, flat-footed manner. "'How do you feel now?' ventured the doctor, arousing himself with an effort. "'Oh, so-so,' sighed the other. "'Only so-so. I can't expect to feel myself, you know.' He reached to the end of the room, and, jerking himself round, started on the return journey. The doctor arose slowly and remained standing. There was barely room for two people to walk up and down. "'Anything might happen,' the clockwork man continued plaintively. I feel as though I might slip again, you know, slip back another thousand years or so." He turned again. "'I've got to get worse before I get better,' he sighed, and then stopped to examine the rows of bottles arranged along the shelves. "'What are these?' he inquired. "'Medicines,' said the doctor, without enthusiasm. "'Do they help people to work?' Hm, yes. Chemical action. Tonics people get run down, and I have to give them something to stimulate the system." "'I see,' the clockwork man nodded sagely. "'But they wouldn't be any use to me. What I need is adjustment, regulation.' He looked hard at the doctor with a pathetic expression of inquiry. "'My clock,' he began, and stopped abruptly. They were facing one another now. The doctor swallowed hard several times, and he felt the blood tingling in his temples. The dreaded moment had come. He had got to see this strange instrument that distinguished the clockwork man from ordinary mortals. There was no shrinking from the eerie experience. Underneath that borrowed hat and wig there was something, something utterly strange and outside the pale of human ingenuity. In the name of common humanity it was incumbent upon the doctor to face the shock of this revelation, and yet he shrunk from it like a frightened child. He felt no trace of curiosity, no feverish anxiety to investigate this mystery of the future. His knees trembled violently. He did not want to see the clock. He would have given a hundred pounds to be spared the ordeal before him. Slowly, with his customary stiffness of movement, the clockwork man raised his arms upwards and removed the soft clerical hat. He held it aloft, as though uncertain what to do with it, and the doctor took it from him with a shaking hand. Next moment the wig came off, and there was disclosed to the doctor's gaze a bald cranium. Then the clockwork man turned himself slowly round. The doctor shot out a hand and gripped the framework of the shelves. As his eyes rested upon the object that now confronted him, he swung slowly round until his body was partly supported by the shelves. His mouth opened wide and remained stretched to its limit. At first, 
what he saw looked like another face, only it was round and polished. A second glance made it quite plain that, instead of a back to the clockwork man's head, there was a sort of glass dial, beneath which the doctor dimly made out myriads of indicators, tiny hands that move round a circle marked with inconceivably minute divisions. Some of the hands moved slowly, some only just visibly, whilst others spun round with such speed that they left only a blurred impression of a vibrant rotary movement. Besides the hands there were stops, queer-shaped knobs and diminutive buttons, each one marked with a small, neat number. Little metal flaps fluttered quickly and irregularly, like the indicators on a telephone switchboard. There was a faint throbbing and commotion, a suggestion of power at high pressure. Just for a moment the doctor tried to realize that he was looking upon the supreme marvel of human ingenuity. He made an effort to stretch his brain once more in order to grasp the significance of this paragon of eight thousand years hence. But he did not succeed. The strain of the past hour reached its first climax. He began to tremble violently. His elbow went back with a sharp jerk and smashed three bottles standing on the shelf behind him. He made little whimpering noises in his throat. "'Oh, God!' he whispered hoarsely, and then again, as though to comfort himself, "'Oh, God!' Three. "'If you open the lid,' explained the clockwork man, and at the sound of that human voice the doctor jumped violently. You will see certain stops marked with numbers." Obedient, in spite of himself, the doctor discovered a minute hinge and swung open the glass lid. The palpitating clock, with its stir of noises slightly accentuated, lay exposed to his touch. "'Stop X-1,' continued the clockwork man, in tones of sharp instruction. Press hard. Then wind Y four three times." Slowly, with a wildly beating heart, the doctor inserted a trembling finger among the interstices of those multitudinous stops and hands, and as slowly withdrew it again. He could not do this thing. For one thing, his finger was too large. It was a ridiculously clumsy instrument for so fine a purpose. What if he failed? pressed a knob too hard, or set a hand spinning in the wrong direction. The least blunder. "'I can't do it,' he gasped. "'I can't really. You must excuse me.' "'Be quick,' said the clockwork man in a squeaky undertone. "'Something is about to happen.' So it came about that the doctor's final action was hurried and ill-considered. It seemed to him that he must have committed some kind of assault upon the mechanism. Actually, he succeeded in pressing the knob marked X-1, and the immediate result was a sort of muffled ringing sound arising from somewhere in the depths of the clockwork man's organism. "'Registered!' exclaimed the latter triumphantly. "'Now the hand!' The doctor found the hand and tried to twist it very slowly and carefully. He had expected the thin piece of metal to resist his touch, but it swung round with a fatal facility five and a half times. The clockwork man suddenly turned round. Immediately afterwards the doctor became aware of a series of loud popping noises, accompanied by the sound of tearing and rending. Simultaneously some hard object hit him just over the eye, and the walls and ceiling of the little room were struck sharply by something violently expelled. And then he felt himself being pushed gently away by some pressure that was steadily insisting upon more space. It was an effect in startling disproportion to the cause, or at least so it seemed to the doctor, who was, of course, totally ignorant about the mechanism with which he was experimenting. "'Reverse!' exclaimed the clockwork man in thick suety tones. "'Reverse!' Already he was several times stouter than his original self. He had burst all his buttons, which accounted for the sudden explosions, and his clothes were split all the way down, back and front. Great pouches and three new chins appeared upon his face, and lower down there was visible an enormous stomach. The doctor seized hold of the other's collar and turned the huge body round. 
his hand fumbled wildly among the stops. "'Which one?' he gasped, his face livid with fright. "'Tell me what to do! In heaven's name, do you expect me to know?' Z five came the faint rejoinder, and reverse Y four. Most important, reverse Y four. It followed upon this experiment that the clockwork man presently emitted a faint, quavering protest. He had certainly dwindled in bulk. His clothes hung upon him, and there was a distressing feebleness of frame. Slowly it dawned upon the doctor that the face peering up at him was that of a very old and decrepit individual. Painful lines crossed his forehead, and there were roomy lodgments in the corner of each eye. The change was rapidly progressive. By this time the doctor's condition of hysteria had given way to a sort of desperate recklessness. He had somehow to restore the clockwork man to some semblance of passable humanity. He pressed stops and twisted hands with an entire disregard for the occasional instructions bellowed at him by the unfortunate object of his random experiments. He felt that the very worst could scarcely surpass what had already taken place. And it was obvious that the clockwork man had but the haziest notions about his own mechanism. Evidently he was intended to be adjusted by some other person. He was not, in that sense, autonomous. It was also manifest that the clockwork man was capable of almost limitless adaptability. Several of the stops produced only slight changes, or the first beginnings of some fundamental alteration of structure. Usually these changes were of a sufficiently alarming character to cause the doctor immediately to check them by further experiments. The clockwork man seemed to be an epitome of everything that had ever existed. After one experiment he developed gills. Another produced frightful atavistic snortings. There was one short-lived episode of a tale. By the end of another five minutes the doctor had sacrificed all scruple. His fingers played over that human keyboard with a recklessness that was born of sheer horror of his own actions. He almost fancied that he might suddenly arrive at some kind of mastery of the stunning instrument. He alternated between that delusion and trusting blindly to chance. It was, indeed, by accident that he discovered and pressed hard home a large stop marked simply zero. The next second he found himself contemplating what was apparently an empty heap of clothes lying upon the floor at his feet. The clockwork man had vanished. Ah! screamed the doctor, dancing round the room, and forgetting even God in his agony. What have I done? What have I done? He knelt down and searched hastily among the clothes. There was a lump moving about very slightly in the region of the waistcoat, a lump that was strangely soft to the touch. Then he felt the hard surface of the clock. Before he could remove the mass of clothing there broke upon the stillness a strange little cry to the doctor curiously familiar. It was the wail of an infant, long-drawn and pitiful. When the doctor found him he appeared to be about six weeks old, and rapidly growing smaller and smaller. Only the promptest and most fortuitous action upon the doctor's part averted something inconceivably disastrous. End of chapter 8